Guys, we're back for another breakdown and predictions video. This one is going to be the third week of the Dana White Contender Series for 2023. So far, we're 2-0 on the Contender Series in terms of cashing our bets, cashing our plays, and uh, giving you guys good predictions. So we're going to be trying to keep that train rolling. And my bad for getting it out uh, so late. I was going to get it out earlier. Um, some stuff happened, so I, I couldn't really... Um, get the video out when I wanted to, but hopefully enough of you guys still get to listen to it and uh, learn something from it, maybe put some bets on. And obviously, you know, I got three or four bets. I got a few bets for uh, UFC already, and there's a lot of events going down this week. So patreon.com slash Emory Prediction Guru is the place to be if you want to get access to some of the best plays, some of the best bets and uh, breakdowns, predictions, just other uh, MMA content on the internet, then you definitely want to go check it out there. And I uh, really appreciate everyone that supports this video. Uh, Put a like on it, uh, put a comment down below, and uh, let's try to win another week here on the Dana White Contender Series. But this week, we only got four fights. One fight was pulled at weigh-ins, or I don't know if it was at weigh-ins. I don't really, now that, um, who was the guy that he, Dos Santos stepped in to fight someone, I can't remember. I think it was Manel Cape, yeah, that's who it was. It was Manel Cape, so he's going to fight him, which is... <laughs> It's a gangster movement. I've been stepping up to fight that level. So that fight got scrapped. Um, he was one of the guys that was going to fight on the tennis series. But this first fight of the night that we have on the show, Robbie Ring taking on Luis Pajuelo. Um Luis, you know, he's another fighter. He's coming out of Peru. In week one, we saw Kevin Borjas, another Peruvian fighter, come in, get the win as a big underdog. So Pajuelo is going to be looking to follow that blueprint. And when you look at him, he's 28 years old, pretty experienced seven amateur fights this is going to be his ninth pro fight all but one of his fights have been in peru against mostly inexperienced opponents and most of pajuelo's fights as a pro have been for the ffc promotion which is probably the biggest promotion over there in peru and his one loss was the one fight that he um fought outside of peru where he went to brazil fought for shooto brazil dropped a split decision and his last fight, he did main event a card. He took out a 13-2 and fighter in the second round. And he was originally scheduled to fight a pretty well-known Cage Warriors fighter, Tobias Harilla. Harilla had visa issues, which made way for Robbie Ring to step in. But obviously, the UFC, you could either think of it two ways. They were setting him up to lose to a guy like Tobias because Tobias is a Cage Warriors guy with some momentum. Or they think highly of Luis and think... He could match up with a guy of Tobias' skill level. But Robbie Ring, he's undefeated. He's 6-0. and He fights out of a lesser-known gym in Virginia. But they do have a lot of fighters training there. And he's 23 years old. He's been fighting since 2015. So I'm not exactly sure how the rule sets were when he was under 18. Because his fights are shown as exhibition fights. But he won both of those. Then he won his first uh, official MMA fight at 18. Went 7-0 as an amateur, and now he, or obviously 9-0 uh, if you count the exhibition fights, and now he's 6-0 and as a pro. He's a two-division and two-promotion champion as an amateur, so very, very credentialed amateur fighter. And in his pro career so far, he's fought really all set-up fights. He's bounced around divisions as well, and kind of just taken anyone that would give him a matchup. He's fought at 135, 140, 145, 155. I mean, that's four different weight classes and six fights total. So four of Ring's fights have also ended in under a minute, and another one only won a minute and 23, or a minute and 27 seconds. So he doesn't have a lot of cage time, ring time. Um total rounds i mean as a pro i think he only has like probably less than 10 total rounds fought and jacob kilburn is his one good victory so far jacob kilburn is a ufc veteran he's fought on the pfl and that fight did go to the second round before ring picked up the submission victory and this is going to be a second tough opponent on paper it's going to be a featherweight fight and ring has just been dominant so far i mean I would be shocked to see him leave without a contract if he could finish Luis Pajuelo just because he's looked so good. But also, it is a short notice fight. It's a guy that's used to not having a lot of resistance. So who knows how the fight will end up if Pajuelo can make it hard to take him down and can, you know, provide some issues for Ring if he's going to be able to overcome that. But Pajuelo is a brawler. He's long, lanky. He throws fast, straight punches. He's good on the inside. He'll throw elbows, knees, and his volume is really insane. He throws 
really fast combos. And if you stay in the pocket with him, um, he's just really, really dangerous. But he is timeable, though, and has a bit of a reckless style. You could catch him with low kicks. You can walk him into big punches. He tends to duck his head a lot, and I've seen him get dropped with knees before. He is extremely tough, though, and like I said, he pushes a really high pace. So fun fighter to watch. But the issues that he's had so far is with his wrestling. He has bad wrestling defense. He can get taken down, and he gives up his back. His grappling looks subpar. He gets held down when he's taken down most of the time. He usually doesn't get back up to his feet. When he can drop a guy or sometimes I've seen it seems like he's pretty good at turning in and moving into top position when fighters take his back. And when he can get on top, he does throw big ground and pound. So that's a danger spot. You don't want him on top of you. And his cardio is probably one of his best assets. And Robbie Ring, he's a submission grappler. On the feed, he keeps his hands high. He tries to stay defensively sound, kind of minimal striking, and then get the takedown. Mostly just lets his hands go when he feels safe, when he can back you up, and he throws with power. And in his fight with Jacob Kilburn, he was able to just catch all of Kilburn's kicks and take him down that way. It seems like he has great vision. And he was able to back... Um, Kilburn was able to get back up to his feet a couple times, but Ring showed smarts, good cardio, Made the fight pretty much a grappling fight. And when he can get fighters against the cage, he can get them down that way as well. He has the cardio to wear guys down, it seems like, at least from that one fight that went longer with Kilburn. And he's a finisher, man. I mean, he was able to get a leg lock or close to a leg lock in the first round um, on Kilburn. And then Kilburn actually did put him in a deep arm triangle. So that's why I'm saying I think... In this fight, he really has to avoid being on his back. That's the only spot I've seen him vulnerable in a fight to date. But I would say his front chokes are definitely his most dangerous finishing move. People who are long and attack Darce are always tricky to deal with. And that's what you have in uh, Robbie Ring. Obviously, Ring still needs to be tested against legit fighters on the ground. But he looks high level in that area. He's a black belt. And he should be able to submit Bajuelo if he can make it a grappling-centric fight. Cardio for ring like i said it looked good but most of his fights have ended quickly and we really haven't seen a fight where a fighter is able to keep it standing against him so i feel like in this matchup ring probably gets it done with the grappling but pojuelo is dangerous man ring is unproven in certain areas and if pojuelo can keep it standing and put some punches knees and elbows on him maybe he can overwhelm ring who's used to being the hammer and he likes to get close though pojuelo and he leaves avenues to clinch him, to take him down. And I think if he ends up on the ground with Robbie Ring, Ring could show levels and find that submission victory. So I'm going to say Ring wins via first-round submission. And I feel like he is um, going to be a decent fighter in the UFC if they can develop him right. But obviously, he still has a lot to prove and is pretty inexperienced. And up next year, we got a good fight, in my opinion, with Isis Verveek. She's going to be taking on Josephine Knutson. And Isaac Ver Verbeek, she's a fighter fighting out of the Netherlands. She's 4-1 so far. She dropped her debut, but she hasn't lost since. She's been fighting pretty good competition from the start. She'd be a 3-1 fighter in her last fight. She's competed for big promotions from the beginning, too. Her first fight and her most recent fight both took place in Invicta. She's also competed for Icon FF, which is a promotion on Fight Pass. She's competed for Combate Global. And outside of MMA, she's been competing at world level for a long time. She's uh, a girl that at 21 years old debuted and fought for glory kickboxing. And she's had, I believe, over 100 kickboxing fights and fought some pretty high-level girls in that sport. On top of that, she's fought bare knuck MMA. Her last MMA fight was over a year ago at this point. Her last fight was a boxing match in which she lost, but... I kind of put virtually no stock into that because it was a two, one two-minute fight that went to decision. And I think it was like a – I don't know if it was like on a reality show or a competition. But to lose the one two-minute round, I mean, that it's not really much of anything. So hopefully Ferbeek was keeping on the MMA training and we see an improved version of her. We saw Then we saw her last July. She has been training in Colorado with Rose Namajunas for this camp. So – We'll see if that does pay dividends for her. And for Josephine Knutson, she's also a fighter that comes from a kickboxing background. She trains out of 
the famed All-Stars Training Center in Sweden, and she's currently unbeaten in MMA. She's one of the uh, one of the uh, girls. She has 32 kickboxing fights. She went 27 and five. Her last kickboxing match was in 2019, and she lost a split decision in the K1 World Grand Prix. So obviously, she was fighting at a high level the last time she left that sport. On top of her pro career, she was an uh, amateur international uh, Muay Thai gold medalist. She's been competing at a high level for a long time. In MMA, she has fought the better competition. She's been a little bit more active as well. And she's also competed for the UFC before, technically, when she fought on the Road to UFC tournament last June. At 27 years old, she should be closing in on her prime, and it's a good time for her to be receiving this opportunity. And this should be a good stylistic matchup because both these girls are strikers. Even though I see Nutsen trying to pressure or control, controlling the clinch a lot and maybe hit some takedowns, but Nutsen is a pressure fighter. She's fast. She can close the distance quickly, cuts the cage off pretty well, and she'll switch stance to try to uh, cut girls off. But she can be a little flat-footed, and she doesn't really faint her way in or work her way in the most effectively at times. I feel like Verbeek can stick and move on her if she doesn't get tired and um with Nutsen she is accurate with her punches though and she will throw combinations she'll throw a one two to head kick combos she'll throw a lot of body head punch combos stays very active and I do think she's going to be the more consistent striker higher volume and probably the girl going forward in this fight but the clinch is where I think it's going to be interesting if Nutsen can control the clinch for multiple minutes she could have a fairly easy night I think Nutsen has the superior grappling. But Isaac Verbeek, man, she's a dangerous, explosive girl. She doesn't throw a lot of combinations, but she'll throw big, powerful left hooks. She'll throw some one twos, three twos at times. Devastating knees, flying switch knees. Her speed and accuracy on her knees are is kind of rare to see. And it's something that fighters definitely have to be aware of. And she does have the superior footwork and foot speed in this fight. She needs to stick and move. That's her path to victory. And throw the big power shots, try to get nuts in to respect her power and make it more of her pace. And Verbeek struggled a bit her last fight with a really big girl that's a good boxer. And if Nutsen can get inside on Verbeek, she should have some success. But for Beek, for Beek, I see her relying more on the big moments, big punches. And Nutsen, um, she doesn't really move her head much. So I do think there's a chance that Isaac, Isis can land a big flying knee, big left hook, big combination, and... Uh, stun nuts in or maybe land a few big combinations and pot shot her and cardio it seems like nuts has the better cardio for because pretty good cardio but it does seem like she can get a little tired but i think this fight could go either way it's pretty close early on i think for beak is going to be faster more powerful and have success maybe even rock nuts in but it's just going to come down to if her beak has the gas tank to keep her footwork going for three rounds or if she's going to tire and let nuts in get off with her inside combinations, clincher. And due to the line, I'm personally going to lean with Verbeek because I feel like the odds should be closer to a pick and they got Verbeek at almost 2.5 to 1. So I don't agree with that whatsoever. I feel like it's a close fight, coin flip type of fight, and um, I'm going to go with Isis Verbeek to get the win via decision. And moving on here, we got Oban Elliott. He's going to be taking on Kike Brito in this one. And Elliot, he's looking to break the recent trend of Cage Warriors fighters dropping the ball in Contender Series. Elliot is a pro. He's had all 10 of his fights with Cage Warriors. He's never made it to a title fight, but took out some pretty good fighters. And he's established himself as one of the better welterweights in the UK. Up until now, he's fought all European opponents and all of his fights have been in the UK. This fight, he's getting a different look. He's fighting a Brazilian style fighter. He's having to travel to the US. He's 25 years old, so still young, and hopefully he's ready physically and mentally for this moment. Kike Brito, he's an experienced Brazilian fighter. He's young too at 26, but he's already 16 and 4, so he has double the fights that Oban Elliott has. And he had his first few fights in Brazil, but since 2019, he's fought in promotions all over the world. He's fought in Macau, Russia, Slovakia, the Czech Republic. And he competed mostly for Octagon, which is a big promotion in Europe. His last fight, he beat a 30-11 and 11 opponent to win the Octagon Welterweight Championship, which I think is a pretty big deal. And this is going to be his first fight of 2023, but he has the momentum of the title win behind him. And just like Elliot, it's Brito's first fight in the States and a big opportunity. So we're going to see 
which fighter steps up on the night. For Oban Elliott, he's an all-rounder. I wouldn't say he's overly good anywhere, but he's average everywhere. On the feet, he likes to use his speed. He'll throw jabs, one-twos, try to be evasive. He will try to attack the body. He uses the body shots to set up the double leg. But his double leg, to me, is a big tell. It's kind of obvious when he's going to shoot. And he will mix in kicks at times, but really primarily works the hands. Defensively, I feel like Elliott isn't the best. And I do think the jab of Kike Brito is going to potentially give him a lot of issues. Also, just the power ability that Brito brings but Elliot looks stay evasive kind of avoid exchanging he wants to be all the way in or all the way out and then he looks to time the double leg and he does have a pretty fast double and he needs to establish the wrestling went through his top control here his best asset I would say is his cardio he can guard for he can go hard for three rounds and he pushes the pace with the wrestling so that's going to be what he needs to do for Kike Brito, he's a brawler. He can be wild, but he has a really good jab, which I feel is going to be very effective in this fight. He'll throw some power straights, overhands, and he will exchange with big hooks in the pocket. You'll see him throw spinning attacks. He has pretty good kicks, and he's a one-shot KO type of guy. He's improved his takedown defense, and I do think he's the bigger, more physical of the two fighters, but it's still a little questionable. And on his back, he will throw elbows. He's decent with his jiu-jitsu. He stays active. But I feel like Elliot can nullify him a little bit when he's fresh and hold him down. So Brito has to be cognizant of that and work back up to his feet if he does get taken down. Cardio is going to be the difference here. I feel like if Brito gasses, Elliot could wrestle him to a win. But I think likely Brito is going to be the one that finds the knockout here. I think Elliot, if he can, like I said, work the gas tank of Brito and kind of work his top control to win, that's going to be what it is. But I think Brito's a lot better on the feet. I think he has a power edge. And Elliott's been finished by strikes in both of his losses, so I kind of see it happening for a third time. I saw the knockout prop, though, and the odds are kind of trash. So I feel like it's a pass for his fight from a betting perspective. Um, but I'm going to go with the Brazilian here, and I'm going to go with uh, Kike Brito to get the job done. And in this main event here... We got Eli Amaroff. He's going to be taking on um, his opponent, Zachary Reese. And this is an interesting fight. It's kind of a tough fight for me to break down. With Eli Amaroff, we got a guy that high-level wrestler, amateur wrestler. He was on the international team for Israel. He wrestled all around the world. He had a lot of success in some high-level competitions. And you could tell when you look at him, man. I mean, the guy's a tank, very explosive, very athletic. And he's not necessarily the most polished MMA fighter at this point but his explosiveness power and wrestling is what has got him to this moment he has fought for Bellator and in his last fight he did beat a guy that is a former contender series alumni but most of his wins have been kind of throwaway victories and he hasn't fought the highest level of competition obviously he has a lot of experience competing against the best of the best in wrestling but in MMA, he's still unproven, but he did come over. He's training at Extreme Couture, and I think that's a great spot for him to be at. A lot of great wrestlers there, a lot of guys and coaches that know how to kind of make that style win. So he's in a good spot, Eli Amaroff, and um, we'll see if he can deliver on the night. But uh, Zachary Reese is going to be in front of him. He's a huge guy, really big for the weight class, and you could see it when they stand across from each other. Reese is 6'3", is a 79-inch reach, which is going to be a 7-inch reach advantage. And Reese, we haven't really been able to see much from him, though, at all. I mean, he's been fighting in the Texas scene. Um, recent fights have been for Fury. and He's taken out a couple, like, tough journeyman Fury fighters, but most of his opponents as well have been low-level, kind of um, easy victories for him. And you see his wins they've all been really quick victories where you haven't really been able to see much I mean all you've seen is that the guy has really good length he could throw some straight punches that hurt you he is a good high kick and when you shoot in on him you got to protect your neck because he's going to be coming for those front chokes and if you put him on his back I did see him throw up a triangle submit a guy in an amateur fight but Amaroff I do think he's improving his striking he kind of has rudimentary striking but his last fight 
we did see him throw a little bit straighter. He was mixing in some kicks and seemed a little more confident. But kind of at this point, if this fight stays on the feet, Reese is probably going to snipe him because Amarov kind of just closes his eyes and wings to close the distance. But we haven't seen Reese face a guy with this wrestle, wrestling acumen yet. And really it's tough to for me to envision that he's going to submit him with a, unless we see... Eli Amarov get really tired, which Reese is the one that hasn't been in the later rounds. And I think if he can't potentially catch a submission early or a knockout early, it could be a long night for him. Um, with Eli, I feel like it's going to be tough to submit him. I mean, the guy's a tank. He's a gorilla, super strong, super explosive, athletic, and he has elite level uh, wrestling background. He's training with good grappling coaches it seems like he has good positional awareness good submission defense and if Reese catches him with a front choke or with a uh, knockout early I wouldn't be shocked I think Reese in round one is uh, probably a pretty good bet but I'm gonna go with the underdog here I'm gonna go with Ellie to get the victory in the main event I just think he's gonna embrace the grind I feel like Reese may have a big moment early where he almost gets the finish but I think he's gonna exhaust himself and I think once Eli Amarov gets on top, starts working his top game, which he does transition effectively. You'll see him move into side control into the crucifix, and he works hard to get the finish. He has back-to-back -back arm triangle submission wins. So I feel like he's going to be able to wear down Reese, and we haven't seen Reese in these later rounds. We haven't seen him fight a guy that has been able to kind of beast him on the ground. So I'm going to go with uh, Amarov via second or third round submission or KOTKO. But I feel like Reese round one is a decent play there. And then Amar Amaroff late is also a decent play. So thanks for watching, guys. Obviously, I'm going to be back soon. I'm going to be breaking down a UFC card. And uh, there's other events going down this week at five time. Maybe I'll drop a PFL breakdown on the channel. But PFL, man, they're kind of like, I don't know what's going on. Like, why do they have a fucking fight card every day of the week? Like, now they're going on Wednesday. So it's kind of throwing me off. But, um... Yeah, man, thanks for watching this video. Like I said at the beginning of the video, hit the like button. Put a comment down below if you want access to the bets that I have for this event, all the events this weekend, and just uh, other additional content. Patreon.com slash Guru is the way to go, and that really helps the channel. So I appreciate everyone that goes over there, supports, and uh, kind of keeps the lights on over here. So thanks for watching, guys, and I'll be back soon talking to you guys about another fight card.